Coming up on this week's show, the creators of the Promised Land children's book, Adam Reynolds and Chaz Harris, are here to talk about their new project. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knaus. Welcome to episode 109 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from JeffAdamsWrites.com. And I'm Will from WillKanaus.com. This week's episode is brought to you in part by listeners just like you. We'll have more information on how you can help support this podcast in just a few minutes. Uh, Welcome back, everybody. It's another Monday, and we have another episode of the show. Welcome back to you, sir. Thank you. How's it going? It's fine by me. Um, Cool. You've been busy. You've been back on the writing wagon this past week. I have. It was it was quite the week. I did. I think we t- we've talked about last week for a little bit. I need to get the code name winger three mm-hmm. draft done, and I put thirteen thousand words on that last week. It's <laughs> just like wow. Um, that's all about dictation, I think. Yep. Um, helping me to to generate more words, uh, even in some of the more difficult passages. Uh, just trying to. Articulate what I want the story to be. My word counts are still up, so mm-hmm. pretty darn happy about how that's turned out. And uh, we also did some stuff around uh, the Dreamspun desires we got for Dream Spinner stuff. Stuff. <laughs> Would you like to enlighten them on the stuff? Well, uh, this past week we received our uh, final cover for the hockey player's heart. It's so pretty, and we've also received our definitive publication date. It is going to be. Dropping on January 15th of 2018. Yes. For those of you who subscribe to the Dream Spun series, you'll end up with it on January 1st or thereabouts. Yep. And for those of you who just pick them up randomly, that's January 15th. I was excited to see that we're going to end up and be Dream Spun number 50. Uh, yes, I think <laughs> that was just sort of a lucky fluke. Uh, I'm very happy and very proud to be number 50 in the Dream Spun's line. Yes. That's going to look really nice on our whole Shelf full of dream spuns that we've got. So in addition to that news, we also submitted the first three chapters of the next book in that particular series. Yeah, I was very pleased about that. Uh huh. We should be getting a uh, word back on that particular, uh, I guess. In the next couple of weeks, we'll yeah. hear back on if they think we're in a good direction. Yep. So yeah, fingers crossed on that. Awesome. And so, uh, this week we have some new patrons to thank. Yes, we do. Uh, thank you to Lindsay and Anne for joining us on Patreon. Now, you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon. And for as little as 25 cents an episode, your pledge helps pay for the cost of producing and distributing this podcast. For fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you'll have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of our upcoming guests. And all patrons have the option to have a personalized thank you sent directly to them. Mm-hmm. Now, any month that we have pledges that cover our monthly production costs, we'll produce a bonus show, especially for our patrons. And we will be recording the November bonus episode pretty soon. Next week. Coming up. Yep. Yeah. So if you are a patron and you have questions for us, we'd love to get your questions. Uh, We're also asking our patrons uh, a question this month as well. And all those details are over on... Where can they find those details? Uh, That's patreon.com slash Podcast. Um, also, we've got some pretty nifty guests coming up. Um, if our uh, Patreon subscribers would like to ask questions of those particular guests, uh, just head, o- head over to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast. Your favorite new YA hero has arrived with Tracker Hacker by Jeff Adams, the first book in the Codename Winger series. At 16, Theo Reese is the youngest agent for tactical operational support. His way with computers makes him invaluable. He designs new gadgets, helps agents, including his parents, in the field, and works to keep the TOS network safe. But when a hacker breaches the system TOS uses to track agents, Theo is put to the test like never before. Thrust from behind the safety of his desk, Theo must go into the field to put a stop to the hack. He's scared, but resolved because one of the missing agents is his father. 
And just to make it more interesting, he has to keep everything a secret from his boyfriend and teammates. Can Theo get the job done, save his dad, and make things good with his boyfriend? Find out in Tracker Hacker by Jeff Adams, available in ebook and paperback from Harmony Inc. Press, Amazon.com, and other online retailers. So after a brief hiatus from reading and reviewing, uh, we are back on the pony? I, bandwagon, maybe? Bandwagon? <laughs> I don't know. Jeff and I have been reading a lot. Jeff, what would you like to tell our listeners about today? Yeah, I've got a, an audio book and a new anthology to talk about. So the audio book is The Queen and the Homo Jock King by T.J. Clinton. This has been out for a while. It's been on my to-read list for a while because I was fascinated by this um, particular story. It's book one in the At First Sight series, and I have to say that reading book two, I didn't feel like I was missing a lot, so I think the, you can read them out of order if you choose to. Uh, this particular book is about Sandy, who's a drag queen at a local bar called Jacket. She is held in a handbasket, which is <laughs> such a good drag name for her, <laughs> for sure. And uh, Darren, who is the local homo jock king, who is also the mayor's son. In this, it's all about, it's just like a Hallmark movie. It saved the bar. <laughs> <laughs> we have to save the gay bar. Uh, because the, lo the local, uh, the mayor and some of the other folks in town are looking to shut it down. And so Sandy uh, ends up being begged by the bar owner to do what's necessary to uh, turn the tide, as it were. And a scheme is cooked up for her and Darren to become a couple. Uh, either as Sandy or as Helena, and it kind of waffles back and forth with a lot of hilarity. Uh, they end up teaming up to do this. Darren doesn't know for a long time that there is a scheme in play here because he's kind of had his feelings for Sandy, and Sandy's kind of had feelings for him, and it's a very much I hate you, I love you, I hate you kind of enemies to lovers thing that happens here. Um, I It was totally endearing. Uh, and it's so funny at times, and it it really does that TJ thing where it's very funny, and then it can swing over to being very serious. Uh, I loved it to death. I just, it was a delight to read, and Michael Leslie's narration was just spot on. I loved how Sandy had a particular voice for Sandy and a slightly different one for Helena, especially a different um persona because uh sandy explains several times that helena is also like his uh armor that he wears uh i loved how darren also had some really uh tender moments towards the end of the book that were very different from his kind of blustery homo jock king uh that he was up front uh in particular i have to say that i love michael's narration of uh darren and paul's grandma uh, who I swear reminded me from the very first time I heard that voice as being Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> <laughs> Older Catherine Hepburn. Think on Golden Pond, Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> so yeah, I really, really enjoyed this book. Uh, it was everything I wanted in a full-blown... I, I think TJ considers this one of his comedies, and it, I certainly enjoyed the laughter. I enjoyed the romance that budded out of it, and I will probably go back and read book one and book three at some point in the future, because I know those are uh, our Paul and Vince-centric uh, books, and Paul and Vince play a lot uh, into this book as well. And uh, I'd like to see more of those characters, too. So I quite enjoyed it. Thumbs up. Uh, the other book I read uh, is a new one from Harmony Inc. Press, an anthology called Harmonious Hearts 2017. And this book uh, in includes stories that are the winners of Harmony Inc.'s uh, fourth annual Young Author Challenge. So the 15 stories here are all LGBTQ short fiction by authors who are aged 14 to 21. And the 15 stories, I love the spectrum that they ran. Not only are the authors themselves uh, all over the spectrum of the LGBTQ uh, plus uh, spectrum. I'll just use that twice. Uh, but the stories themselves encompass characters along the entire spectrum as well. Uh, to just call out a few of them, uh, First, Second, Third by Elliot Joyce uh, involves Derek and Thomas. Um, Thomas is also on the autism scale. And Derek is initially 
turned off by him, but then as he gets to know Thomas more, falls more and more for him as a friend, and then wants to date him. And as you might imagine, Derek is very, not sorry, Thomas is very reluctant to do that. And the story between these two boys is so sweet. Uh, Apple Sauce and Oatmeal by Claire Hecala, I hope, <laughs> uh, it revolves around Rosewell, or Roswell, uh, who's a girl named Rose. And Rose is how her family actually wants him to be, but he bristles at having to be Rose. And the transformation that happens for him when he's befriended by the new boy at the farm next door uh, named Jay is so sweet and just it shows you the, what the power of a good friend can be to help you kind of overcome things. Lovers in the Great Collapse by Amy Carruthers. Uh, this one is a sci-fi uh, that has the end of the world happening and Jillian and Jacqueline manage to somehow find some love uh, in the midst of being uh, taken away from the world and put on an ark to help uh, humanity survive the Great Plague that happened. And then there's The Fall by Cat Blake, uh, which has Jake, uh, who's just about to end his life when he meets Aaron, who offers him a sandwich and a friend to talk to. Uh, I don't always get into stories that revolve around suicide because it's a very difficult thing to read, but it's very sweet how Aaron kind of pulls Jake back and brings him back into life. Uh, that, was, that was just so well done. Uh, kudos to all these young authors for taking, in some cases, really big, complex stories like Lovers in the Great Collapse, where you're like going off on an arc because there's a plague, uh, and really distilling these things down into some really well-written, compelling short stories. I, I really loved all 15 of these, and I highly encourage you to pick it up uh, and give these young authors some support. Okay. What was the name of it again? It is Harmonious Hearts. Awesome. I'll have to check that out. Now, you've also got two books to tell us about. I have been reading. Uh, the first book I'd like to tell you about is Lace Covered Compromise by Sylvia Violet. Now, this particular book, if you're listening when this episode of the podcast drops, is coming out today. Uh, I snagged a uh, pre-release paperback copy when we were at GRL, and I just finished it. And I liked it a lot. Um, this is an enemies to lovers story, which isn't something I usually get into um, because I usually feel that too much time is spent in the enemies aspect of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I did enjoy this one. Uh, it is the story of a guy named Adam. Uh, he's rich and well-to-do, and he is about to inherit his family's uh, multi-billion dollar conglomerate uh, company. Okay. But when his father dies, he leaves part of the company to Nate, who runs the company's uh, environmental division. I picture the company, it never actually says specifically what like Kingston Corporation is all about. I kind of imagine it as like Johnson & Johnson. Uh, where, you know, it started out, maybe started out with Band-Aids, but it's like branched out and has like a ton of different subsidiaries. Uh, and there's a lot going on with this one single company. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, Adam is our first person narrator. And um, you're either going to hate him or love him. <laughs> either you're going to go, okay, I get it, you're damaged, let's move on. Or you're going to go, oh, so, you know, he just needs the perfect man to mend his broken heart. And I have to admit, through most of the book, I was kind of like in the middle okay. between those two things. Um, like I said, Adam is the first person narrator, and um, he spends a lot of the book, frankly, being a dick. Um, <laughs> he's... He's very stubborn and very entitled, and he is very angry uh, at Nate for, you know, owning part of this company that he believes is his birthright. Um, but he also finds out that Nate has a certain l lacy secret. He pr prefers uh, um, delicate undergarments. <laughs> and... Uh, 
Adam finds himself attracted to that, to that concept, even though he hates Nate's guts. Um, <laughs> he's like, oh, that's very, very interesting. Um, and at about uh, the one third into the story, uh, the enemies become lovers uh, and they have their first hookup. And Adam finally kind of gets around to thinking about, well, hmm, maybe a relationship with this guy and a compromise business wise is something I should be thinking about. And then uh, another th third of the way through the book, they have sex again, and he finally starts to open up emotionally, which is where I feel like the book really started to take off because we finally understand um, what Adam's damage is really all about. Mm. Um, I, a one little note, I think the book would have been better served with um, some other viewpoints. That yeah. way that way we can kind of understand Adam's prickliness. Um, when it's just from his point of view, we don't really get the entire picture. But if there was someone else that we can understand, you know, he may be a dick, but he also has, you know, good qualities as well. I wish there was a little bit more balance in that way. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, <laughs> Adam and Nate eventually work things out. Uh, and there is just about the sweetest date ever. Um, oh, God. It's just so, so schmoopy and wonderful and so sweet. And it made me go, aww. And it made me forgive everything Adam did, like, in the first half of the book. <laughs> also, this is some of the hottest, nastiest sexin uh, you're ever going to read. Woohoo! Thank Go you, Sil Sylvia. Sylvia Violet. Oh, man, this is some really hot, sexy stuff. So I highly recommend Lace Covered Compromise, especially if you're into enemies to lovers. I think this is a, a really fun read. Cool. Okay, the second book I want to talk about is Two for Trust by L. Brownlee. And Elle is a new author to me. I've never read anything by her before. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this book. The title refers to Finch, who is uh, gone to England for a vacation. And he has bought a ticket, uh, sort of um, a ticket to visit uh, certain historical trust sites in the area. Mm, okay. And uh, unfortunately, he made a, a mistake online. Instead of buying one ticket for two weeks, he bought a two-ticket combo for one week. Um, so that's what the title refers to, Two for Trust. And so on his first day touring uh, some historical sites, he runs into this guy, Benedict, uh, and he goes, well, do you, well, I've got the, I've got two tickets and I'm certainly not going to use the second one. Do you want to come with me and tour the site? And Benedict goes, uh, okay, sure. Uh, and so that's what they do. They, they hang out, uh, and they get to know each other. Um, and it's super sweet. And uh, this book itself falls into the sweet category. Uh, there is no sex. Oh, okay. At all. I really enjoyed this book because I think it sort of, kind of hunkers down and just sort of uh, really digs into the relaxed uh, pacing of England. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it. It's, it's sort of like a, a very chill BBC adaptation uh, because you're so immersed in England and the the sights and the sounds, uh, how they go for tea every single day, that kind of thing. Um, eventually, uh, it comes to pass, we learn that Benedict is actually not just a fellow tourist. He is actually a rich guy with a, a historical home of his own. He owns a manor. Nice. Uh, uh, Finch comes to stay with him. And Finch is a nurse uh, from the U.S., of course. And uh, in an order to get Finch to stay uh, a little while longer, uh, Benedict comes up with a plan that Finch will accompany his grandmother to the Netherlands, where uh, his grandmother is going to visit some family. 
Uh, and so that happens. And while they're there, there is an accident. Uh, and we get got some hurt comfort themes going on. Uh, and I just, I really can't do this book justice. I think not only is it, you know, the sort of very British feel, I think it has a very, I can't really describe it any other way than being like an old fashioned historical where like, like looks and glances and, mm. you know, a simple touch of the hand mean an awful lot for Finch and Benedict. Um, uh, eventually, um, there is a family gathering for the holidays towards the end of the book, uh, and a, they work out their differences, and there is a wonderful proposal at the very end. A super, super romantic, schmoopy, wonderful uh, <laughs> proposal at the very, very end. Uh, so I really enjoyed, I don't think I described that particularly well. I was sort of winging it. Usually I take notes when I do a rev review. Uh, but those were sort of my scattered general thoughts on Two for Trust. Um, since the end of this book happens to take place during the holidays, um, now might be a particularly nice time to read this book. The plot doesn't, you know, uh, hinge or revolve around the holidays. Uh, they just happen to like sort of and around the around Christmas. So I highly recommend Two for Trust, a really fantastic read, very sweet by L. Brownlee. Cool. And speaking of holidays, mm -hmm. we have a new holiday book to talk about. Uh, and it's appropriate since it's kind of a children's book episode for us. Indeed. Uh, Santa's Husband. Mm -hmm. By whom? This is by Daniel Kibblesmith, and it's illustrated by A.P. Quatch. Um, Kibble Smith is actually a writer for Stephen Colbert, and um, I don't know if you might remember, last year there was a bit of brouhaha uh, when some, uh, frankly, conservative dickheads uh, made a big deal out of the fact that the Mall of America had a black Santa Claus. Uh, and Daniel Kibble Smith uh, quipped, I think it was just online or maybe even on Twitter, that if he ever saw a black Santa Claus, like sitting in a department store, uh, he would tell his kid that that is Santa Claus. And if we ever saw a white one, he would simply say that is Santa Claus's husband and he's helping out because Santa is busy this time of year. And that's essentially the uh, genesis of this particular book. Um, this sort of reminds me of the cute little golden books. Mm -hmm. um, it's The illustrations in particular reminded me of they're that. They're really cute, super adorable. Um, it's a super fun, quick uh, read for... Uh, you know, maybe a, a cozy, cozy afternoon in front of the fire with your kids. And hot chocolate. Hot chocolate, indeed. Yeah. What did you think? I thought it was adorable. I'm so glad we picked it up. Um, I love I love the story that it tells, why Santa would have a husband, why San, what Santa's husband does. Mm -hmm. um, I love its inclusiveness that Santa is a person of color, but that there's also some pages in the book that highlight other religions who may not even have Santa, but all the Santa variations there are around the world and how Santa's evolved yep. um, just in the U.S. Uh, and it all happens very quickly, so you're never like bogged down by any of it, but it was so cute. Yeah. So yeah, pick up Santa's husband. Support, support inclusiveness in Santa land. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Santa's husband is a really cute holiday read, and I think we both recommend it. Yeah. Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online. Please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. So earlier this week you had the chance to talk with two guys uh, that I particularly admire, um, the team behind the Promised Land book. Yes, got to talk to Adam Reynolds and Chaz Harris about not only the genesis of Promised Land, which as you know, we both are just head over heels for, uh, which is a children's book that came out that featured two boys as the leads, uh, the, a farmer and a prince. Yep. And they've got a new project that they're getting underway with called Maiden Voyage, which is 
two girls at the front of the story. And uh, we talked to them about that and about the Kickstarter they've got going on now to get that book going. Today, I'm excited to welcome Chaz Harris and Adam Reynolds to the podcast. They are the co-creators of the Promised Land book, which is a wonderful piece of inclusive children's literature that uh, Will and I fell in love with earlier this year. The podcast listeners have heard all about this book uh, over the last few months. Welcome, Chaz and Adam. Hi. Hello. So let's get started uh, with a little more about yourselves. Um, tell us about your backgrounds. Chaz, we'll start off with you. Um, yeah, I um, originally from the UK and moved to New Zealand about 10 years ago, and I uh, originally come back from a background in film, so I worked for film producers and uh, in development in the UK uh, for a producer called Alison Owen, who did Elizabeth and Saving Mr. Banks, and then um, moved to New Zealand, and I've been doing kind of short films and web series, uh, and then from there, have sort of weirdly segued into children's books, <laughs> where the way life throws you a curveball. <laughs> <laughs> and Adam? Yeah, I was born in Wellington, New Zealand, um, so lived here my whole life, and I come also come from a film background, and I work as a assistant editor on a children's television series during the day, and then in my evenings, work on Promise Land, Maiden Voyage, and also a lesbian web series called Potluck, which was also um, made here in Wellington, and I'm an editor on that. Fantastic. So how did you two meet up and come together to work on Promise Land? Well, um, uh, I first met Chaz at my graduation for my film school. Um, someone else in my crew uh, knew Chaz and invited him to come and see our graduation film. And um, from there, we chatted to each other and um, I had a script that I was working on um, that I wanted to Chaz to have a look at and so we had a meeting and we chatted about that and then yeah segued into Promised Land. Yeah I remember it was sort of a, um, it's the end of a conversation about the first script and then Adam had sort of mentioned oh there's this other project I, I'm kind of thinking about you know working on uh, and then I kind of pounced on that and I was like tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> And then, yeah, I think I went home that night and I just suddenly had like all these ideas and I think I sent about like a five page email <laughs> of stuff. I was like, I think we should work on this and see if we could come up with like a story. There was, I, I remember it being about the, we talked about the kind of representation, but we were like, let's try and come up with a story that stands on its own that isn't about sexuality or isn't mm -hmm. defined by sexuality. And that was really where the sort of the whole premise or driving, uh, force for the way to make these types of books came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that approach to the, that the, the sexuality is like the least interesting thing that's going on there. And it's just a story about two people who come together. Yeah. So it was Valentine's 2017 when promise land first came out, which was such an appropriate day after all, what was the inspiration behind farm boy, Jack and Prince Leo? How did all that kind of come together? So I, I guess I first started thinking about it on the bus one day and um, yeah, I just had this idea that I wanted, like, why don't we have an animated film with two, with two gay leads and I love to make it a love story. And, um, and then I, the idea came in of a farm boy and a prince. But then when I started speaking to Chaz, then it became the full story that Promised Land ended up becoming. But it was, yeah, just came from that idea of how come we don't have something like that, something which would have been so useful for for kids like us if we were, when we were growing up, to have that kind of representation and to have that, yeah, something like that in our lives. Sure. Were there any books out there in, in what's currently available that kind of inspired your way, or did you just kind of charge off? with your own vision we kind of um we looked at all of the other sort of fairy tale stories and you know we that was almost how we came up with the story by looking at all of the common structural elements of those stories and comparing them and going oh well we need to have this happen because this look at this happens in well you know all 10 of these <laughs> you know oh there's a spell or oh there's this or you know um it's sort of using 
I was sort of like using fairy tale, fairy tale tropes and all of those things and saying, how can we make that different? How can we flip that on its head? How can we uh, sort of change, yeah, change the conversation, even though that we know that that has something like that happens. But, uh, you know, for instance, you know, you have, oh, there's usually like the damsel in distress. It's like, how can we change that narrative around and, you know, picking all of those kinds of tropes and then laying those down into the story and kind of going, okay, well, that, that still works and it's better than it would be if it was your kind of stock standard fairy tale in the kind of traditional sense. Mm -hmm. Now, when you both talked about your backgrounds a few minutes ago, writer didn't really seem to factor in for either one of you. What was it like taking on the writing role in this and, and writing for a a children's book rather than something of, of television and, and that medium that you'd been more, more involved in. Yeah. I mean, definitely we had the uh, writing experience in scripts. Um, and so the benefit I think that that brings you is that you understand structure, uh, st structure and dramatic structure when you're actually coming up with a story. For sure. um, and the bit that we hadn't really tackled much was writing in prose. Um, and we had a really awesome um, editor called Rebecca Gumbly who helped us out a lot with that. Um, but it, it really took us like a couple of goes at it from, because you know, we had a very detailed, long story outline uh, that we had to, at first. That, so it was a case of condensing it down, knowing what we could take out and it's still making sense. Um, and, you know, then, then just reading it aloud a lot. You know, you sit in a room for hours and get sick of hearing your own words <laughs> in a way, but you're just reading it aloud to go, does this sound nice to read? Does this still make sense? And yeah. um, I remember we did a we did a version where we decided we were going to do the whole book as rhyming, um, and it just got, like, unwieldy. But <laughs> we, we had a version of the book that was very uh, kind of, I'd, I'd say, like, very pedestrian, kind of like, this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And then we turned it all into a kind of a rhyming version and that kind of didn't really work, but we got, found a lot of imagery from visual what, imagery. like the visual imagery yeah. was created by doing that. So, uh, I mean, in terms of the text, you know, there's, uh, things like, um, you know, like Elena, uh, uh, along the surface of the frozen river type stuff. Uh, a lot of that description, description or language came or the imagery of that, uh, came from doing that exercise and then we then wrote it back in prose uh, and found we actually figured out how to write it properly at that point <laughs> it took a few yeah it took a few tries of, of getting it right um, and we sent it to quite a few different people that we trusted yeah. for feedback and stuff because we yeah we knew we wanted that outside perspective just to help us make sure that what, what we had was right and was going to read well with parents and that yeah. kids were, were also going to enjoy it. Um, cause Chaz, you sent it to your friend who has children and right. And she read it yeah. to, to her children. Yeah. She's, she's got, um, kind of ADHD type kids. <laughs> they just won't stand still. They just won't sit still. Um, and they just they sat there and they didn't there were no pictures but they sat there and listened to the whole story uh and she said they didn't move the whole time they listened um and they didn't have any questions at the end that's I remember a very when good I, sign yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and then right at the end of like oh no when they actually got the book i remember skyping them and he uh her, her older son uh, leaned into the camera and was like, why are there two boys kissing at the end? <laughs> and I remember I, I didn't really know what to say at that time. And I just remember kind of replying, because you're asking me that. And he kind of was like, oh, okay. That's a great answer. <laughs> as, adult, as an adult, I can say, that's a great answer. And, <laughs> and exactly what the book needs to exist. Yeah. In the, in the journey of creation, did you, was there a thought to go and try to find a traditional publisher for children's books or was it always something you wanted to bring into the world on your own? I think it was something that we, we knew we wanted to, to create it on our own terms. Cause we knew we wanted to push so many, so many elements of the book that 
that traditional publishers are currently too scared to push. And we knew that the representation had to be there and that we knew we wanted a kiss at the end and we knew all of these things that we knew we that had to be in the book and that we were worried that a traditional publisher would try and change or take out. Um, we have since release of the book like looked into traditional publishing as a way to try and get it out there further now that it's created, um, but it's still very difficult to find a publisher willing to to pick it up and yeah yeah which has been which has been a strange experience i had a couple of meetings and it was just um it you know it seemed to be the reason that they didn't want it was because there's a certain style of artwork that traditional picture books that they publish they'll have the top 10 illustrators for uh, the uk for example there are the top 10 illustrators of picture books and if it's not by them it's not going to sell as far as they're concerned um and so I had a weird meeting uh, with a publisher in London. There, uh, you know, that per- that picture book editor in particular was a person of colour and gay. But they said to me, um, "We wouldn't publish this book here unless we just changed all the illustrations." So uh, I was like, "I was like <laughs> Meryl Streep in The Devil Wears Prada." Just like, no. <laughs> I, I'm just I'm flummoxed by that answer because this artwork is gorgeous. Yeah, it's amazing. But I think that's the, that's the difference between what, if you're a writer of illustrated books, the traditional way of doing it is you're just a writer, you give your text away, the, the text is bought by a publisher, then they go off, they find the, the illustrator and commission the artwork, and then you get your book at the end of it. Uh, because we're both, technically, we, are, we come from visual art backgrounds, we knew what the book looked like in our heads, both of us have a very clear vision and almost every page we completely like that was exactly what was in yeah. head. every single page yeah. we went into a lot of detail on the composition of where characters yeah. would be where the text would be going like we were we were completely hands-on with yeah. every page of the entire book and that will help well because we're from that kind of yeah. visual film background we we knew a lot about yeah that. so it was we were able to give very much a detailed brief to say this is what we want it to look like. Um, but if you've got better ideas and then there were things that changed because, you know, Christine or Bo, they kind of said, Oh, what about this? And they're like, Oh, that's better. Um, so yeah, from that perspective, it's, it's a case of we got to collaborate on the visual side of the book in a way that we wouldn't ever be able to do with a traditional publisher. Um, and also had control over a lot of the way it was marketed and promoted when it came out. Mm hmm. Of course, and that's crucial because you never know necessarily with the with the big publisher how that's going to all kind of shake out. And it's like once it actually exists. So now you know we've gone out there and we've managed to get support from quite major, um, quite major people. It's like we kind of have everything that they would need. Like they can put the quotes by Ian McKellen or the <laughs> George Sakai. Like if, you know, put that on the back of their edition. Like we've got it for them. It's like what it. The hesitancy is weird. Um, I understand it. I sort of understand it a little bit more and a little bit less in America just because of like 44% of all of our orders have come from America and Canada, which still surprises me because we are a long way away. Um, But yeah, so I would have thought, you know, you kind of go, oh, I would have thought that there would be publishers there that would really want to take it on maybe more so than somewhere like the UK. Um, But at the same time, it's obviously a much more charged uh issue there right and we should mention as you just said that you know there is the with 44 percent of the orders coming from from north america that there is the sticker shock occasionally for people who pick up the book because the shipping is as much as the book itself yeah yeah um which we can certainly say to everybody it's worth it buy the book (laughs) yes um it's the thing about that as well, that's sort of why for the, the Kickstarter we're running at the moment for Maiden Voyage, we've only promised a paperback edition. Um, we only promised a paperback edition of Promised Land on our first Kickstarter. Uh, and then we actually upgraded to hardbacks because uh, we were like, this is the first book. And it's amazing that we even got to make it or that it's a thing. We upgraded to that. And I think what we might do after this Kickstarter is uh, over, depending on how, uh, how much we raise, we'll, we'll maybe offer the option to upgrade to a hardback through our store or something mm-hmm. um, later, just because it's the additional shipping 
um, it was a lot more than the book to actually ship a hardback. Um, yeah. Yeah, whereas I'm sure. yeah. shipping a paperback is the same cost as the book, so it's a little bit more manageable. So it, um, it's still not ideal. No, but, but yeah, at least like, the ebook is also equally gorgeous yeah. for people yeah. who want that. And we've got that on Amazon and iBooks and on Amazon. our website as well. Yeah. So we've got that everywhere we could we could get it. We've tried to make sure that's available too. And it's really, I mean, it is really good in that sense uh, with the way that the world uh, and technology has sort of enabled types of the, the, these kind, kinds of stories to get out there. In 20 years ago, even, um, if we'd done something like this, you would have to go to a traditional publisher because you'd have no way of getting it out uh, out there. Um, yeah. you, you know, we don't technically need to be in bookshops. You know, we have bookshops that are very kindly taking it on, but um, they you know, one, one or two bookshops asking for a copy of the book, you know, it's like, it's, it's not worth it. Um, you know, the, the cost, uh, of actually getting it to them is more than, um, you know, it, you can actually get the, get direct to the audience, uh, with online stores and, mm -hmm. uh, all of the technology that's available, uh, and eBooks. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's great that at least there's it's really the raising the awareness and people knowing about it because I think there's still even the LGBT community like internationally I think still doesn't really know about a book. Um, it, Unfortunately, it's that's yeah probably true. That's w one of the reasons we very much wanted to have you guys on, um, especially yeah. as you're getting going with this new Kickstarter for Maiden Voyage. So let's let's kind of move over and talk talk a little bit about that. Uh, it was back on October 11th, which was National Coming Out Day, that the Kickstarter for Maiden Voyage was unveiled. What's coming up in the new book? Oh, well, it's a high sea adventure um, with lesbian protagonists. Um, and it's got pirates and an evil queen. And, yep. yeah, the, the story's in really good shape where we have it currently. And... Yeah, we're just doing final touches on it. But, yeah, it's, we're really, really excited for to be able to bring it to life and to show people this, this brand new section. Basically, the idea for the new book is that it's set in the same world as Promised Land, but it's got completely different characters. And if you... Um, with the first book, we had a map at the start of the book, um, and there's a little port on the bottom bottom right hand side um yeah there it is a little <laughs> port port Chaconi in the on the bottom right hand side and that's where sure. our new tale begins and then we travel south from there to explore sure. new waters yeah. and one of the things i like about the book so much too besides being inclusive sexuality wise is it includes many persons of color yep um across all the characters, which is just another mark of that inclusiveness. Yeah, for sure. We, that was really important to us to make sure that we were inclusive on all the fronts that we could be and to try and, you know, make this a book that is as good as it can be and, and can resonate with as many people as possible. How important is Kickstarter to the process overall? Uh, your, your first one was certainly very successful, uh, as we're recording this, we're actually recording this just a couple days after the Kickstarter began, and you're already to a third of your goal, which is great. And there'll be a week left of the Kickstarter when this airs. But how important is it to to the whole getting the book ready to go and out to the world? Um, well, it wouldn't exist without that. So yeah. <laughs> that's pretty. It's pretty vital. Um, you know, the they're they are expensive books to put together because you're paying for illustration uh, of you know 32 images and then actually have to pay for the printing and um you know we found also that you know there are print on demand um we couldn't do print on demand because of the dimensions and shape and type of book that we chose to, to make which was kind of error on our part <laughs> we kind um, of decided that we wanted it to kind of be kind of wider like a nice wide almost widescreen type yeah. images um so you get like nice big images and we wanted it to be a, a big size and yeah, sort of like a lap book that you can sit yeah across your laps and read but um 
Yeah, I mean, Kickstarter is probably the, the, again, going back to what I was saying about the technology and things that you can do now, you can go straight to your audience and go and find them and say, hey, do you want this or help make it happen, which is um, sort of the power dynamics have shifted a little bit in that sense. It's just then you really, it's like the, you need the Kickstarter, but then it's also vital that you get um, the media coverage from people that are willing to talk about it and write about it. Um, so the two of those go hand in hand um, because if people don't know that it's there as well, I mean, we're, we're lucky that, that, that this time we did have an audience. Uh, we did have uh, all the people who backed us on Kickstarter the previous time to go out to and say, do you, you know, we've done this and now we've proven what we can do, um, which we certainly didn't have the first time. So I think that's really helped. Mm. What were your expectations going into the first one? Did you feel pretty good about getting funded? It was, it was quite nerve wracking, I think, because we we really liked what we had. We really liked the story. We were really proud of of what we had come up with, um, and the concept of the whole book. And we definitely thought it was something that was needed. But we just weren't sure whether other people would agree. Um, and that was what was exciting about by the end of the first Kickstarter was we had that proof that that this is something that people want, this is something that people need, um, and that was awesome. There was a, definitely a period during the first, like, maybe three weeks of that original Kickstarter where it wasn't looking like we were going to make our target and we were struggling to get, to just get, just to get the Kickstarter to, to, to people's eyes, I guess. Yeah. But, but then in that last week, everything picked up and we just smashed our goal. Yeah. And so we got, um, we got some New Zealand news coverage and that sort of it, it was what sort of, uh, I think, triggered the rest. Um, and then, yeah, kind of just went a bit viral after that. Um, but, yeah, they say that you're meant, in order to be successful on Kickstarter in your first few days, you need to raise a, between, between 25 to 30%. Um, and so we hadn't raised that at all on the first Kickstarter, I think. Or had we? No. Yeah, it must have been about that, but it wasn't in the first few days. That was in the first yeah. three weeks. Mm. Um, so because of that, we were this kind of like, ah, <laughs> is it going to happen? Um, so that was really great. And, yeah, uh, I mean, we kind of can't predict the future, but we hope that that will, you know, pick up uh, uh, in terms of, you know, the media will want talk to talk about it. Um you know, this time. And I think, I mean, it was interesting. We chose to do, we chose to do a, a, a book with lesbian protagonists because we had a lot of people uh, who had got this first book who were uh, emailing us going, oh, you know, can you do a princesses one? Or can you do, you know, one with two leads? Or can you do a trans book or anything like that? So we'd like to do that. Um, but we want to make sure that when we're doing them, we're doing them correctly and authentically rather than you know, um, I saw a comment on our Kickstarter this morning of saying, you know, oh, I hope your books in, uh, include uh, trans trans characters, um, and our map includes references to you know um, many kind of trans women of color in particular. But um, we wanted to make sure that when we provide characters of an identity, that they're lead protagonists, yeah. that they're not. Uh, sidelined or that they're not supporting characters like that everyone get everyone should be the hero of their own story mm -hmm. so that's sort of the that's the idea the of the goal. whole series going forward is that yeah. each book would have a different identity protagonist and hopefully we're also uh, we also want to work with authors that are of that identity so that we're not speaking for anyone mm-hmm What's the the grand plan for this for, for these books? How how far do you think it can go, and how far have you looked out in the future already? Um, it's, it can go as big as people want it to, really. Yeah. <laughs> as big and long. <laughs> um, I mean, we're we're really just focused on the second book to see whether it's it's like people want us to expand this. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, ideally it would be a series of books following different LGBTQ protagonists. And then from there, who knows? I mean... Yeah, it's you just see how, how popular it is. And um, yeah, the biggest thing is just getting it to an audience, really. Mm -hmm. The the filmmakers in you, would you, do you, would you love to see a, an animated 
film of some kind come of this eventually? Yeah, well, we can't say we haven't thought about that. But <laughs> that'd be pretty amazing. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a lot easier to kickstart a, a book and create the story, the, the storybook version of that uh, than it is to do. I mean, you just couldn't kickstart a, a movie version uh, as an animated film. Well, you you could try, and it wouldn't actually be very good. Like you actually want it to be a, you know, kind of um, gold standard uh, yeah. version. And it, I, I sort of describe them as like these are the stories that um, these are the stories that should have uh, that um, that should have been that never or that never were that should have should have always been. Okay. Uh, so we're just sort of like trying to. That was another comment about. You know, when I was talking to a publisher and they were saying um, about the artworks, like, oh, if you wanted to one day do something like this, like, why are you using old style animation, sort of, uh, sort of uh, artwork inspiration? Why aren't you using sort of the, you know, that you have that more modern uh, 3D animation look? And I was like, well, these are the story, like, I, like what I just said. It's like we're slotting into trying to slot into history here of like corrective correcting what hasn't been done that should have been. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that appeals to me so much is that it is the old school type of drawing that I grew up on. Yeah. Mm. Uh, in, both, was... in both my animated movies and my children's books. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think also now for our generation, we grew up, like, fairy t- we didn't really read that many fairy tales, but fairy tale stars looked like that. Um, so, and our generation's becoming parents now, so... That's why I think it will, will appeal. It's just a case of getting it in front of people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So for people who might be coming to the Kickstarter in this last week, where, where we will be when this airs, what would you recommend as like the backer level that gets that gets them the most bang for their buck and and would be the ideal kind of gateway to getting into the to the promised land uh, we have- world? We, one of our rewards is a bundle where you get Promised Land, a printed copy of Promised Land and a printed copy of Maiden Voyage. So if they don't have the first book, that would probably be the one to go for, I would say, where you get both. There's also an ebook version of that where you get just an ebook of each of each as well. So those those two, I imagine, if they were completely new to, to the series. Yeah. Cool. Well, we will definitely be linking up to the in our show notes to that Kickstarter, because um, we want to see you guys get funded, because we want the book, <laughs> nothing <laughs> else. <laughs> now, I noticed on your website that you're you're part of this Inclusive Mind Collective, um, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about that, because I really like the, the mission of changing the face of children's books. Uh, what is this initiative? Yeah, so um, Inclusive Minds is a UK-based um, uh, initiative, and it's all about you know kind of they have a charter about um, kind of publishers or you know in, or authors or who or writers even um, taking sort of taking taking stock or taking the initiative to write and create projects that represent the world around them that aren't um, just kind of following the the standard formula that, that what what, of what that's of what has come before, and it's not just about sexuality. It's you know it might include disability. It might include um, you know uh, making sure that your books are ethnically diverse or anything like that, um, and uh, and even you know I guess to some, to some extent it might be uh, religion as well. Uh, and it's just about making. I guess providing resources and providing stories that authentically represent the world rather than, um, yeah, rather than just kind of continuing what, what has come before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's really nice to see that happening out there because the children need to find themselves in the books in the same way that adults do. For yeah, sure. Sure. So what's the best way to keep up with the the Promised Land projects as both Maiden Voyage gets ready to go and anything that comes up in the future? Um, well, we do have a newsletter. But, um, so if people go to promisedlandstore.com, there's a newsletter they can sign up to. Uh, and then, yeah, we have a Facebook page as well. Yep. We're, We're on got, Twitter. Yeah, Twitter, Instagram. We've got everything. 
but that newsletter gets updated. We usually send out something at least once a month with an update of everything that's happening with the book and with the books with the new one. Mm -hmm. um, so anytime we get new press or whatever, we'll be we'll let people know yep. through there and yeah, any exciting news or new products get sent out through there. Yeah, and you've certainly expanded the the, the product line quite a bit. I mean, we got one of the posters a few months back and yep. the oh, coloring no. pages and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we um, the coloring book was really cool launching that a few months back. Um, and we, yeah, no, I work, yeah, I've got um, a couple of the prints. I've got a we've got a, a giant version of the map, so it's like that's sort of in my wall in my bedroom. It's got like the, the, all of the kingdom of Valeria. <laughs> the that's... artwork's just beautiful, you just you need it printed around out you. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we wish you guys so much success. It's really awesome that you're bringing this stuff out into the world, and uh, hopefully, it'll inspire more not only not only for people to pick up your stuff, but for other creators to take the jump on it as well. Yep, yeah, sure, yeah, definitely. We hope so. Adam and Chaz, thank you so much for being with us. Thank right. you for thank having you. us. So it was really great talking to their two, finding out their background and how they got, how they went from filmmakers to children's book authors. Mm -hmm. Now, as we mentioned in the show, or in the interview rather, the Kickstarter has one week left. Um, as we're recording on November 5th, they are just under 75% of their Kickstarter goal. So help them out, come in there, be a supporter. You'll have the opportunity if you pick the right stuff and you don't have Promise Land that there are bundles in there for awards that give you Promise Land and Maiden Voyage. So do that. <laughs> We've done it. You should do it, too. <laughs> yes. Where can they go? To Kickstarter.com? Kickstarter.com. You can search for Promised Land there, or you can go to the show notes, and we'll link you directly to uh, the Kickstarter page. Okay. And also, I should mention one more thing that happened to them this week. They also became a Kickstarter project we love. And that was awesome, too, that Kickstarter gave them the extra boost of being one of those projects. Awesome. So, so yeah. hopefully everyone out, out there in in podcast land will support Maiden Voyage. Yes. So coming up on episode 110, uh, I just a couple days ago got to talk, talk to uh, J. Scott Coatsworth. He'll talk about his newest book called The Stark Divide, and we'll also find out what goes what's going on with some of his other ventures like Queer Sci-Fi, Queer Romance Inc., and another service he's actually starting up around blog tours. Oh, that'll be cool. Yeah. Okay. So guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter if you have a book. Until next time, everyone, keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. 